from European Union uh, states represented here, uh, lords, uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen uh, and uh, Rusi guests, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to Rusi and to our Library of Military History. Uh, this has been a forum for discussion of some of the key issues of UK defence and security policy uh, for more than a century. Uh, and it's also been a place where in days past, uh, le less technological days perhaps, this is where scholars of military affairs actually did their work. Alas, uh, we now do all our work hunched in front of computer screens. Uh, but we still make great use of this library as a forum uh, for discussion and debate. And this meeting is very much in that uh, proud tradition. RUSI is a non-partisan institute, so in that spirit we take no position on the merits or otherwise of Brexit, uh, but we have consistently uh, made the argument uh, that the security relationship between the UK and the European Union uh, after Brexit is a really important part of the negotiation process and it's vital for us as a country that we get it right. Those who argued perhaps at an earlier stage of the process that this was all about economics and there was no security dimension to Brexit, I think, have been shown uh, to be wrong. And that's why I certainly welcome the fact uh, that the government from a very early stage has made it clear that getting that security dimension right is a really important part of the negotiation. It was key, of course, to the Article 50 letter and it was uh, the key theme for the Prime Minister's speech at the Munich Security Conference, which uh, my Director General, Karen von Hippel, uh, who is, I think, at the back, and myself. Karen, you're here, sorry. Karen at the front. Uh, my, uh, Karen, myself, uh, attended the Munich Security Conference and listened to the Prime Minister's uh, very substantive speech uh, on security in that uh, occasion. So I'm especially delighted uh, that uh, David Davis, the Secretary of State, is with us today to talk further uh, about where we are uh, with the negotiations on the security dimension uh, of Brexit. After his presentation, uh, the Secretary of State will take a, a number of questions uh, from representatives of the media uh, who are here, uh, and we plan to wind up at around uh, 4.40 p.m. Secretary of State, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Deputy Director General, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, as you alluded, it's uh, a particular pleasure to be speaking here uh, in this grand library at uh, the Royal United Services Institute. Uh, the think tank, you said, for over a century has uh, hosted debates about matters of defence and security. Indeed, before we came in, the, uh, uh, the Deputy Director General was telling me on the context of uh, emails and uh, and the printed word that I share with the next head of MI6 an aversion for emails and a preference for the printed word. I wonder why that is. <laughs> uh, now, in its security that I principally want to uh, talk about today, in the context of the overarching new partnership we want with the European Union uh, after we leave, one that recognises the history that we share, history that fills the hundreds of books uh, in this magnificent room, uh, and builds on it as we start a new chapter in our relationship with the European Union. We have five main aims for the new partnership. They were laid out by the Prime Minister in detail in her Mansion House speech. But there's one aim I want to particularly concentrate on today. And it's the need for this new partnership to stand the test of time. Because we can get bogged down in the day-to-day -day grumblings, we mustn't lose sight of the uh, that goal during these negotiations. That's why we, the, the uh, United Kingdom negotiating team, have avoided tit-for-tat briefings out of the talks. We've seen how this has damaged other European negotiations. And we don't want to undermine efforts to build a lasting, positive relationship with the United Kingdom's closest neighbours and allies in the European Union. A stable relationship built on trust. That doesn't need to be revisited or renegotiated, one that's not so unacceptable to either side that in a few years' time it fails completely, and one that provides the benefits of our collective power 
to all our citizens for generations to come. It's not about membership light. We'll be off the council, no longer have a commissioner, be no, uh, no British uh, MEPs in the European Parliament, no British judges, no opt-ins. Put simply, the UK will no longer be a member of the European Union. The decision to leave the European Union is about delivering control back to the British people. So they get the final say on how their money is spent, how their laws are made, how their borders are controlled. It will mean a new, different relationship with the EU. That should not, however, should not ignore the decades of trust, collaboration and cooperation that have existed between us as if they never happened. Collaboration that has benefits beyond the borders of Europe, out into the wider world. Pan-European cooperation has kept people safe. It's kept people alive. It's protected the peace. We don't want to be, uh, we don't need to be members of the European Union for this cooperation to continue. But for the relationship to endure, we do need, we do need to leave the European Union as friends and allies. Friends who trust each other. And anyone, frankly, who suggests that the United Kingdom cannot be trusted and isn't the proven friend of every single country in the European Union needs to brush up on their history. Britain has always stepped up to its global responsibilities. We put our world-leading military power at the service of our shared values and always have done. We use our position as one of the world's most advanced economies to create jobs and spread prosperity. And we celebrate our respected independent legal system setting a global example of fair trials and stable laws. We are champions of a rules-based international system and work to defend the security of people both here and abroad. So that's why we set out early and publicly, as the Deputy Director General said, our proposals to continue security cooperation with the European Union. We're publishing detailed technical papers on specific issues, such as Galileo and internal, secu and internal security. And our discussions with the Commission will continue between me and Michel Barnier, Michel Barnier next week. Our offer remains unconditional. At its heart, a strategic partnership that allows us to tackle the full range of threats that we face. A partnership that respects the autonomy of the United Kingdom and the European Union, but importantly, allows us to continue to work together. Because the operational expertise that's currently shared between the UK and countries in the European Union has meant our people are safer and more prosperous. Agencies such as Europol have helped break up criminal gangs and prevented drugs and guns ended up on our streets. The European Arrest Warrant has brought dangerous people swiftly to justice and put them behind bars. Meanwhile, information sharing has helped stop countless terror attacks by making sure that Critical information is picked up, shared quickly, and acted upon at speed. But these tools and systems don't work in isolation. It's the way they interact that means they're effective, because they've been designed carefully that way over time to respond to new threats. Let me give an example. Say a person radicalized online leaves Europe to train at a terrorist camp in Syria, intent on coming back to radicalize even more people and carry out a deadly atrocity. There are multiple systems and tools in place that are able to pick up on suspicious behavior, from Facebook posts to travel bookings that link to the functioning, link to the functioning of agencies. So European authorities can pick the terrorist up before they can target and kill innocent people. And as the threats we face continue to evolve, to evolve so must our collaboration. Because we must work together and quickly if we want to avoid any gap in our operational capability, a gap that could be exploited, putting people in harm's way. The first duty of government is to keep its citizens safe. And it's the pursuit of that safety that made Britain make that unconditional offer to the European Union. And any move by others to place conditions on our offer will only serve to put the safety of everybody's citizens at risk. Because when terrorists set off bombs and fire guns, be it on the streets of Paris or London or Manchester or Brussels, 
They don't check the passports of their victims first. So in approaching the trade-offs of Brexit, the United Kingdom made a choice. We decided that Europe's safety was far too important to be negotiated away. And so while we know things must change when we leave the EU, that cannot be at the expense of citizen security. Now that means, of course, that we'll make appropriate contributions to the cost of the programmes we want to remain involved in. And when participating in EU agencies, the UK will respect the remit of the European Court of Justice. For that, we'll need a solution to close legal cooperation, which respects our unique status as a third country with our own sovereign legal order. We are presented serious, considered options about the shape of that future security partnership, designed to, to respect the decision-making autonomy of the European Union, uh, as well as the United Kingdom. However, it is sometimes said that the limits of our cooperation have been set by the United Kingdom, that on leaving the European Union and not being under the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, there will be an automatic drop in security cooperation, that we are the only one with a choice. I don't agree. The European Union does have choices. And when I see the positions proposed by the Commission, I see choices being taken there ones which lean towards a, uh, the protection of legal precedence above operational capability. This may be deliberate. It may be where the EU sees us ending up, but there is an alternative path, one that sees the institutional architecture of the EU as a means to an end, not an end in itself, one that leads to a partnership which reflects the reality of mutual gains available to the United Kingdom and the European Union and its member states. And as the Home Secretary said on Monday, there is not a single European interior minister who wants to reduce the level of cooperation on security that we have now. Take, for example, the European arrest warrant. It's played a crucial role in supporting police cooperation, not least in Northern Ireland and Ireland. And when I travel across Europe, speaking to my counterparts in the EU member states, I hear how much they value this scheme and the weight that the UK brings to it. Before it came into force in 2004, fewer than 60 criminals a year were extradited from the United Kingdom. Since then, we've extradited more than 10,000 criminals so they can face justice. And for every person on a warrant from British police under the scheme, we arrest eight people on behalf of other member states. These are gangsters, terrorists, murderers, dangerous criminals who are off the streets and in jail thanks to cooperation fostered across borders. People like Hussein Osman, who planted a bomb in the Shepherd's Bush uh, uh, station during the failed London bombings in July 2005. And despite fleeing to Italy, he was located and extradited back to the UK, where he was found guilty of murder, uh, attempted murder, and put in prison for 40 years before he could carry out his deadly intentions elsewhere. Or killer Piotr Kupczyk, who fled Poland to Britain after murdering a man at a football match. He was working in Wiltshire until a European arrest warrant brought police to his door and swift extradition, extradition back to face his crimes. Another example of these systems is the European Criminal Records Information System. Through it, the United Kingdom and countries right across the EU exchanged th tens of thousands of pieces of information about criminal convictions. We are consistently one of the top three contributors and users uh, of ECRIS. Last year alone, we sent and received more than 600 requests and notifications a day. We were if we were frozen out of ECRIS, neither the United Kingdom nor the member state uh, police forces would be able to quickly obtain criminal records information from each other. Courts might no longer be able to take into account previous convictions when deciding on guilt, sentence or bail. And law enforcement agencies may, lo may no longer be able to protect the public when dangerous individuals move between the United Kingdom and the European Union. And it's through that need, that lens, that need to protect the public, that we must also look at how we best cooperate uh, over Galileo, the European Global Navigation System. This system will provide significant space capability for Europe. Once in place, it will have secure global coverage that draws on UK, uh, UK 
hosted rather, sensor stations in the South Atlantic. The project is making the European space sector more competitive. It will mean armed forces across Europe can work better together, enabling us to jointly develop operating procedures in the most testing conditions. And weapon systems are more effective, better able to achieve their aims with minimum collateral damage to innocent civilians. Because Galileo is so important, UK industry and military experts have been instrumental in its design. We spent hundreds of millions of pounds on the project and thousands of hours of work has been dedicated to make sure the system is secure. But now the Commission is suggesting that by being involved, the United Kingdom poses a risk to the security interests of the European Union. British companies are being discriminated against, blocked from applying for contracts to design and manufacture parts of the new system. And this is happening despite the fact that excluding UK industry would delay the project by up to three years and cost the programme an extra billion euros. Put simply, the Commission's position seems to be shooting itself in the foot just to prove that the gun works. This is not an issue isolated to Galileo. The same is, is at risk of happening with the new European Defence Fund. The UK and our industry are already making a meaningful contribution. But the EU's approach to the provisional regulation risks damaging potential cooperation in the long term. On all of these unhelpful precedents and assumptions on how third countries should cooperate with the EU is hindering projects that would help the entire continent. Dogmatic responses based on what has happened before don't help anyone. And actually, when I hear that by going beyond precedent for the UK, agreements with other countries will have to be re-examined, my response is, why is that bad if it makes our continent safer? So what we're proposing is a collaborative approach, one that goes beyond existing agreements by recognising the combined successes we've had so far. We're proud of the role we've played in making our continent safer. We've taken such actions because we are friends and allies of the European Union and its member states. Europe's security is our security. Our relationship can be different because it starts from a different base. When we leave the EU, our data sharing systems will be uniquely compatible with theirs and our operational processes will already be closely aligned. That makes it much easier to continue our existing cooperation rather than starting afresh. On Galileo, we're proposing a framework that reflects our contribution to the programme and gives UK industry the ability to participate openly and fairly on its development and usage, including the crucial secure elements. We should be able, as trusted allies and friends of Europe, to get an agreement that allows sensitive information to be shared. Looking more widely, the security partnership with the EU should enable us to work together on new tools for the future. So that when criminals and terrorists use new and emerging technology to try and evade capture, state and police systems can evolve at pace to tackle them. In our upcoming white paper, we will say that our future security partnership should include formal, strategic uh, and operational dialogues that allow the United Kingdom and the European Union to learn from each other. It will set out our ambition for our new reciprocal secondment program for security experts as a way of sharing skills and expertise. And we want a comprehensive, deep partnership with the European Union on a whole range of matters that have an impact on our security. On counter-terrorism, where systems like SIS2 mean we flag to our European partners that individuals linked to terrorism have travelled to the UK. And the Passenger Name Record Directive allows us to work with European partners to track individuals on terrorist watch lists uh, and identify their accomplices from their movements. On foreign defence policy, we'll continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with our allies in Europe, on addressing the migrant crisis in the Mediterranean, where the UK has committed a ship and vital expertise to the operation which has helped save more than 13,000 lives. And we will look to carry over all EU sanctions at the time of our departure and continue to work with the European Union to make sure we both implement effective sanctions in the future. Because we must do whatever is most practical and pragmatic to provide security for all of Europe's citizens. Now, I've spoken before about how the UK has always seen the European project differently. It's because we think differently about the EU 
that the people of the United Kingdom, I think, voted to leave. Confidently acknowledged that we would be able to agree a new way of trading with our allies while taking back control of the country's own future. So as well as partnership on security that we want, as I've already set out, we want a new economic partnership too. Many have suggested the only thing on offer for the UK and the EU's future trading relationship is an off-the-shelf model based on agreements uh, made before. But what's important is that we agree a partnership that's broad and deep and balanced by mutual commitments. is isn't a case of asking for special treatment. We are leaving the European Union. We're leaving the single market and customs union, so things will change. It's not about trying to recreate everything the EU does for the benefit of one member state. It's about recognising the centuries-old cultural, social and economic ties that exist between us. And the fact that we will share those same laws and regulations on the day that we leave. This unique starting point is a solid foundation of mutual trust for this new economic partnership and also reflect the UK's position as one of the world's largest economies, one of the EU's closest trading partners and one of its most dependable allies. So as well as uh, security, our upcoming white paper will set out at length the steps we want to take to keep as close a trading ties as we currently have and make sure that trade stays as frictionless as possible. It will tackle once and for all, the heavily propagated myth that the UK doesn't know what it wants. By building on the Prime Minister's speeches, our existing white papers, our 17 summer papers and countless presentations made directly to the EU about the partnerships that we want. One that recognises that these trade negotiations are completely unique in history. Again, we're going to need the European Union to recognise the United Kingdom is not your average third country we're going to get trading agreement that defends jobs across Europe. Our economies have deep linkages in their supply chains. Aeroplanes, vehicles, chemicals cross the UK-EU border several times during the production process. A typical car part may be moulded in the UK, painted in Slovakia, and then assembled back here in the United Kingdom. This is underpinned by the fact that these products need undergo only one set of approvals, which our plans for a comprehensive framework of mutual recognition will ensure continues. This, of course, is essential in the context of Northern Ireland and Ireland, where the ability of businesses to make world-leading products depends on their ability to cross the border many times, sometimes in the same day. Now, as well as goods moving across borders, engineers, electricians, manufacturers will need to cross them as well. So getting a deal that reflects the deep economic ties that both the United Kingdom and the European Union uh, benefit from is vitally important for both of our economies and strong economies of course are vital to security and vital to the people whose livelihoods depend on them. So those who say or think that the UK must be seen to be damaged by Brexit should think again because the truth is if you harm Britain you harm all of Europe. Now, every trade deal is bespoke, tailored to meet the needs of each side. And to be fair, that approach is understood by the EU's no negotiators as well. They have suggested a number of un unprecedented elements in their proposals for the economic partnership. Their call for commitments on level playing field go far beyond any ordinary or conventional free trade agreement. So again, this idea peddled by some that the UK would face a stark choice, Norway or Canada, doesn't hold water. So what's next? Now, of course, I recognise that Brexit isn't popular for many people in the European Union. Going around Europe, it's clear that people do not want us to leave. I understand that. But the British people made their decision for reasons I think are correct, decent, uh, and in the long-term interests of our country. We'll still be the open, tolerant, welcoming country we've always been. We'll still welcome young people from uh, across Europe to our universities and doctors and nurses to train and work in our hospitals. Meanwhile, tourists, business people, even government ministers will still travel between the United Kingdom and the European Union to exchange ideas, do deals and work. Now, both sides of the negotiating table have a choice about how best to get the new partnership we need and make the United Kingdom's exit for the European Union as smooth and orderly as possible. We have chosen right from the beginning 
to recognise the specific responsibilities that lie with us as the party choosing to leave. And that's why we're putting forward practical solutions to the obstacles that might otherwise undermine the long-lasting, deep and special partnership we want with the European Union. One that respects the institutional architecture of the European Union and the constitutional and economic integrity of the United Kingdom. For Northern Ireland in particular, that means both sides recognise the commitments we have made to avoid a hard, a hard border. And the responsibilities each side has flowing from the Belfast Agreement to respect both communities. But we must move on from the fiction that a customs border down the Irish Sea will be acceptable or indeed enforceable. Now when I look at the relationship between the United Kingdom and the 27 remaining members of the EU, there are reasons to be optimistic. And I make no apologies for being so. Our interests are so aligned that the only threats come from, not from deliberate action, but from what we fail to do. The primary risk in these negotiations is actually now one of accident. That due to a lack of ambition by resting on third country precedents, we miscalculate somehow. And the cost of miscalculation is a deal that's unacceptable to both sides. That lets down the citizens we're both duty bound to protect. Now is the time to redouble our efforts and open our minds once again to build an enduring new partnership between the closest of friends and allies. There's every reason for these negotiations to succeed. But there is a big world out there, outside of the Berlin Mons negotiating room, one that faces complex challenges that demand collective action, one that's depending on us getting these talks right. Right for the sake of hundreds of thousands of European jobs that depend on trade being as frictionless as possible. Right for the safety of our citizens who depend on security cooperation that transcends borders. If the decades, the centuries of cooperation of European, uh, of, of European cooperation are to continue and evolve, if we are to build a partnership that stands the test of time, and if we are to deliver a bright new future for the European Union and the United Kingdom. Thank you. Now, we promised to take a few questions from uh, the, the, the media here. Uh, where's Laura? There. Um, thank you very much, Secretary of State. Um, Laura Coonsbar, BBC News. Um, have you personally signed off all the details of the government's backstop proposal we expect to be published tomorrow? And if it comes out without your explicit approval, can you stay in your job? Uh, that's a question, I think, for the Prime Minister, to be honest, on the second one. The, uh, the, 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 detail, the, the detail of this is being discussed at the moment. It's been through one uh, cabinet committee, it's going to another one, and it would be improper of me to preempt the negotiation there, but I suspect it will be fairly decisive tomorrow. Uh, let's see, uh, Faisal? Faisal here? Um, just, I'm going to push you on that question. Um, is it true that you're proposing, or it is being proposed, that there's going to be a time limit that is not limited by time? for the backstop. <laughs> and um, just on a separate issue, on the rules of origin issue, um, what do you make of the Dutch government advising their uh, Dutch business that oh, yeah. British parts uh, might, it shouldn't be used in goods for exports into EU free trade agreements? Is this them being over aggressive or is this a natural response of your approach to Brexit? Well, firstly on time limit, I think the Prime Minister has already made uh, public the fact that we expect to put a time limit on the, the backstop proposal. On the, on the Dutch government, I think the Dutch government is responding to what is in effect the European Union's um, own contingency planning. Uh, uh, and that's, you know, contingency planning always looks a bit bleak. Uh, and particularly because we don't intend to arrive at that contingency. We're going to have uh, an out, uh, a good deal outcome. And in the interim, we're going to have the implementation period, which will cover that. Uh, who else have we got? Robert Peston here? Uh, Secretary of State, can, uh, slightly unclear, do, do you expect the backstop proposal to be published tomorrow? Um, and in the absence of that, do you think the forthcoming EU summit will yield the sort of progress that would allow you to get on to the trade talks which, and the security talks that you've said today are so vital to our future relationship? Yes, I mean, I think the, the, the first uh, question, the, the, 
the, the backstop is just that. That's the first thing to remember. It's a backstop. It's not the primary uh, aim in the negotiation. Uh, and it's a part of the issue, obviously, related to, uh, principally related to Northern Ireland. We're not expecting to conclude the Northern Ireland uh, elements of uh, this arrangement until October. So I wouldn't expect um, uh, any time issue to, uh, to stop progress between June and October. Uh, but I'll just reiterate the point. You know, uh, well, it's, it's, for, it's, a, it's for a cabinet committee to, to decide on that, and if they conclude, then, then you'll see it tomorrow. But it, it's, up to, it's up to them to decide that. It's not, not my control. Mesa. Mesa Hall? Right, yeah. Ah, there you are. Um, the, the Prime Minister today uh, confirmed that we will be seeing a white paper uh, on Brexit, but she wouldn't say when. She wouldn't say whether it was before the um, uh, EU summit at the end of the month. Can you enlighten us any further? Can we seriously negotiate if we haven't got this, this vision of, of exactly what we want? And uh, just a question about the, the vote next week. Um, your party manifesto was clear that Britain will leave the EU, will leave the custom union and the single market. Can Conservative MPs who vote for Lord's amendments, can they be allowed to stay in the party? Uh, I think I, you need the chief whip here, don't you, for that? The, uh, um, the, uh, first, firstly, in terms of, let me come back to that. Let, 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 let me let, uh, let deal with this, this issue of the negotiation. Well, the negotiation on the issues I've been talking about are already underway. Those discussions are taking place now as we speak. Um, and I, I've seen there's lots of stories about the white paper and, and, and my views and so on. My, my, my general response to this is, in debates in Whitehall between fast and slow, I normally vote for fast. That's, uh, that's uh, probably a given. But uh, what she said today is exactly right, that the white paper will be published when it's ready, it's up to quality, and it's exactly uh, what we need to say in the public domain. Uh, it will not delay the progress of negotiations. Tom McTague. Thank you. Um, given what you've said today, if the European Commission refuses to move on security, would British citizens be less safe outside of the European Union than they currently are now? Well, the whole point of security policy is to make uh, citizens of both our country and the 27 other member states safer. So clearly, if we don't have a security policy, they will be less safe than they otherwise would be. Uh, the aim, remember, is to save lives, to maintain peace, maintain security. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Secretary of State, uh, we are absolutely delighted that you uh, made this statement here at RUSI today uh, and thank you very much indeed and perhaps I can ask you all to join us in a round of applause. <laughs> and uh, a final logistical point, if uh, members of the audience could just wait a couple of minutes uh, to allow the Secretary of State uh, to leave the building expeditiously. <laughs> Uh, Secretary said, please. Thank you very much.